All right, hello. It is the Brian Hornback Experience. It is episode 114, and I have one of our candidates who ran on November the 8th statewide. Um, those of you in Knoxville and East Tennessee, you know her well. I've known her for a few years. It's none other than Constance Every. Constance, how are you? I'm doing well, Brian. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Absolutely. So, you know, you uh, sometime, I don't know, the first part of the year, you decided you were going to run for governor. You're running as an independent. Um, you know, there was a, a, obviously Governor Lee, the Republican incumbent, and then the Democrats wound up with a primary. But you ran as an independent among several others. Um, but, wow, you uh, you finished fourth statewide with – with uh, almost one uh, percent of the vote, which was uh, wait, 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 yeah, well, about half percent of the statewide vote, one percent of the Knox County vote, you got uh, ten thousand two hundred and sixty-six votes statewide, and you got um, nine hundred eight votes in Knox County. But we're gonna we're gonna talk about some of the other counties too because you had some you had some great showing across the state. So tell us uh, first of all, uh, was it worth it? And tell us about the campaign. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. First off, um, thank you, like I said, again, for having me on the show. Yes, Tennessee for Everyone was my governor for campaign of Tennessee. Um, and as was fat, we started, actually, we announced our campaign September of 2021. That's right. when we actually, officially. Uh, and we had our platform up and running uh, by the end of November, 1st of December. So before the 21 year was out, we did actually have the campaign up and running. Um, <clears throat> and then as far as the race goes, uh, was it worth it? I say yes. I say yes, because uh, as you already mentioned to the audience, uh, and I know you have a following in Knoxville, Knox County area, uh, it's been very challenging in the space. Uh, the resistance here is very great uh, on both sides. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate that we're still seeing uh, how when you are a demographic that is under-resourced and under-marginalized and don't have really good representation uh, on the various councils that we have in our local jurisdiction, uh, and, and you know, you're just not continuing to have those needs been met, uh, but unfortunately, when you have your fighters who are willing to fight for that, but you turn on your fighters, mm. uh, it's just very difficult to service the area. Uh, and so, therefore, yes, moving on to statewide, was able to expand the platform and really meet more people with like-mindedness, uh, found more folks that understand that when we're in the poor uh, conversation that there are many of us that relate regardless of our race religion uh, our gender uh, or any other demographic or belief that we find that we are constantly divided by but divided by as people uh, of america and, and more importantly uh, realizing the potential that there is to win a state like tennessee uh, even though tennessee is yes a red state a majority republican state uh, i had very much success in being able to speak with republican uh uh loyal uh, of voters and still was able to relate and connect with them because unfortunately uh, regardless as far as we talk about the party side of the things the two parties are just not getting the job done and people really are starting to get exhausted uh it is definitely harder uh than maybe it's been in any time frame other than the great depression and in a lot of economists if you watch the news i know you do brian many economists speak to the fact that where we are currently in our economy we are definitely hinging uh right on the some of the same numbers and same statistics and data as it was in the great depression uh uh, and so, therefore, uh, we now have better understanding of what it takes to run a race like this. But more importantly, like you mentioned before, yes, we had presence in areas that I was even surprised at. I mean, uh, one of the things that I think is most successful about our campaign is that even though I did heavily campaign in the western uh, region mm -hmm. of our state, uh, I did pretty good in the middle and east, and I could have done better across the board across our state. But I didn't even really have a presence in West Tennessee. The irony to me was um, – <clears throat> the success of our campaign to pull votes in all 95 counties. Right. Uh, so I'm very surprised by that. Like, wow, we pulled votes in all 95 counties. That's pretty good as a starting base. Uh, and I think that's the other part that should be very critical for folks to know is that this is literally my first campaign ever. Uh, I uh, have nonprofits. I founded a nonprofit that's involved in politics and social justice work. And so we have endorsed candidates. You've seen me around politics a long time. But in reality, me actually being on a ticket, this was my true first ticket race. Uh, and yes, I feel really good about it. Folks who are in politics, uh, I've had many compliments around the 
state and from parties and et cetera, people just in politics, period, uh, have complimented this race and said that, yeah, we're first time candidate. That's a bang way to come in with a race. And so, uh, yes, I think there's a lot of great momentum to build off of Tennessee for one, everyone. Uh, what we saw and looking forward to the 2026 race. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I looked at I looked at everything and you did. You got at least you, you got votes in every, every county of the 95 counties, but. 16 counties in particular, Davidson County, which was Nashville, you got over, you got uh, 1,232 votes. In Hamilton County, down in Chattanooga, you got 513 votes. Up in uh, Hawkins County, Rogersville, Sneedville, you got 72 votes. Here in Knoxville, as we already said, you got 910 votes. Madison and Maury County, you got uh, 154 and 150. Montgomery County, which is up around Clarksville, you got, and I know you spent a little bit of time up there. You got 535 votes up there. Putnam County, 116. One of our neighboring counties, Roan County, you got 97 votes there. Robertson County and Rutherford County, you got 100 and 549. In Shelby County, which is Memphis, you got 1,473. Up in Sullivan County, up in the Upper East Tennessee, you got 120. In Sumner County, which is outside of Nashville, you got... Um, 275 in Williamson County, which is around Nashville. You got 271. And then in probably one of the most Republican counties in the state, Wilson County, you got 242 votes. So again, yep. Uh, yep. again, I, I do think, I do think just, just calling out those 16 counties um, is an indication that you did have some broad base support. So let's mm -hmm. kind of, let's kind of talk about, you know, people, people, um, and they've been dismissing me for years, but people will sometimes dismiss Constance Every. But, you know, I, I think if it wasn't for Constance Every and, and some of the things that you and your folks have done in Knoxville in particular, uh, you know, KPD has body cameras today. Right. Uh, something something that you and, and your group, um, Black Coffee Justice, really worked for. Um, I, I believe, and you can give us an update on this, I I believe we still have, do we have mental health and drug intervention people uh, riding around with the KPD officers today? Yeah, we do have that today too. Yeah, right. we have that as well. And 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 the and the only other thing that I know that y'all worked on was Park. So I know Park has has had some changes. Clarence Vaughn had had left Park and went to UT, and then Lakenya Middlebrook was running Park, and now she's gone on to another cabinet level position with Mayor Ken Cannon. Um, and so what, what, what is your thoughts on, well, first of all, I know that you and uh, our previous chief had at least an ongoing conversation, uh, mm -hmm. you, you and Eve Thomas at least had an ongoing, you and your organization had an ongoing conversation with Eve Thomas. How is that, how, how's that going with Chief Noel? And, or is it going with Chief Noel? And then how, how is Park and Chief Noel, how is, how is that? How is that situation? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, yes, you're right. With Chief Thomas, we did at least have open communication. Uh, and I will give her that credit, that respect. I'll always give her that minimum that she did at least uh, stand by her word when she said we're open to communicate and, and really communicated that. As you know, uh, you know, Brian, me and you both have a sandpaper mentality sometimes when it comes hmm. to our uh, appointed and elected officials because we're going to ask those tough questions. Uh, and so we know that at times it is challenging for folks who want to conversate with us because they know uh, we're going to ask unapologetically the questions of the public because we are the people and they work for the people. Uh, but with Paul Noel, uh, you know, it's it's not good. I, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, one, because we're still dealing with the issue of his hiring in the first place. You know, the fact that the city is literally fighting one of our very prominent local uh, news media outlets on the hiring process, which we know under the Freedom of Information Act is, is a right that the public has. Again, this is a public role. You are an elected official. He is an appointed official, but both of you are working on taxpayers' money. Uh, so therefore, the fact that we're even having this battle over him and his hiring record uh, is already problematic. And again, he's already using the buzzwords of transparency and integrity, but we're not seeing it in his practication. Uh, the second thing is that uh, he has been on city tours that some of the elected council members have brought him to in their community to speak with. Um, and I don't know if you keep up with Tyler Gibbons, uh, but yep. Tyler Gibbons, 
an amazing job at getting these spotlight <laughs> videos of with the appointed and elected officials asking again those tough public questions. Uh, and I am disturbed to see that in Paul Noel, I think at that time frame, uh, we go back and check the date, which I'm sure is there by the posting on YouTube. Uh, but Paul Noel had not been announced in over three weeks. And for him to have such a hostile and aggressive uh, tempo and temperature and even response to Tyler because he wants to ask him questions on camera uh, is already disturbing to me. And it farther shows why we need to find out about Paul Noel's hiring record. Uh, because, again, as you know, uh, and as people already know, Tennessee, as you know, I'm going to speak a little bit from the governor platform because I do have a lot of data now about our statewide conditions. Tennessee has four states that are some of the deadliest states in America listed, i.e. in the top 50 deadly states of America. Uh, as we know, Knoxville is one of those of the four. Uh, the other ones are Nashville, Chattanooga, and Memphis. So obviously where our bigger city urbanized areas are located is where we're having these crime uh, issues uh, happening. Uh, but what is also very concerning to this conversation uh, is that uh, when we look at the crime rate factors, we know that uh, Knoxville particularly is competing with Chicago's crime rate when you talk about the gun homicide. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as we have this interview today, it is unfortunate that in this show, I'm going to literally have to announce that not East Knoxville community, particularly which is the predominant area of where the black community lives at, had another death in the community last night. Mm. Uh, another community member was murdered, unfortunately, last night at his home. And so we're still seeing this issue. Uh, and more importantly, the other issue that also comes to concern about the police department and our current community and Indy Kikana's current administration is also the factors of uh, the violence interruption programming. You know, uh, this programming was supposed to be trying to impact the communities known and, and well uh, uh, interest points and areas where we know the, the crime and, and the violence is kind of manifesting itself at. And as we know, unfortunately, it is our youth community. Uh, and we know it's our young men community at that because you can't just leave it at 18. We're seeing this between the 18-year-olds up to about roughly about the 35-year-old black male having this issue particularly. Uh, and so the problem that we're also seeing is that we have been spending money on violence interruption, but this violence interruption cannot give us a metric of success. It cannot give us a strategic plan uh, of what is its ways or its tactics this or is a uh, uh, programming is going to attack or really address the issues of gun violence uh we don't even know the true partnerships that are involved in this like who is your community partners who are you really working in the grassroots spaces to reach these particular individuals of youth in areas where they hang out at and participate in uh and so we're just not seeing clear methods of, of really trying to address this and again this is unfortunately falling all under uh paul noel's leadership and like i said already having a controversial presence in our city and even controversial response uh i'm just not feeling very confident that once again Again, he's not the man for the job. And unfortunately, once again, Anthony Cannon has failed to listen to the public voices and once again has gotten this election wrong. All right. Well, and I, I was at I was at one of those events. I believe it was the event that Seema Singh had uh, in her community introduced Paul Noel. And and I happened to be there uh, and, and watched uh, Paul Noel walk away from um, Tyler as Tyler was trying to ask him some questions, I think, in in relation to Anthony Thompson Jr. Uh, Paul Noel has since come out and given a statement um, about about the Anthony Thompson Jr. situation. Again, that was a young man uh, who was shot and, and uh, murdered in, in an Austin East bathroom. Uh, what was your reaction? I mean, I know you were in, in the in the you were in the in the belly of a governor's race. But uh, now that you've been a week or so, uh, a couple of weeks after your governor's race, what was your I mean, I don't I don't think any of us were surprised that what Paul Noel said about the Anthony Thompson Jr. case. Uh, and I think probably we were just surprised that it took him so long to say it. Uh, that's my impression. But um, what were your thoughts about what Paul Noel ultimately had to say after he reviewed the Anthony Thompson Jr. case? Uh, yeah, I, I think you hit it right on the on the head when you said it from the get go. None of us were so were, were surprised by his statement or even his reaction or any of that. Uh, I think for me is uh, yes, I feel like the 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 press conference was unnecessary because it came off very scripted. Uh, I'm like you, Brian. He already knew how he felt about that before he even got here and looked at anything. Uh, again, this is unfortunately accountability on the police department. As we know, uh, the issues around Anthony Thompson Jr.'s murder at Austin East High School in the bathroom is really around the issues of policy and how poorly the application of policy was done uh, by the Knoxville Police Department and Knox County Sheriff Department. Because again, that is who is in the SRO contracts uh, with the school under the memorandum 
agreements that KPD and Knox County and Knox County school systems do collectively share. Uh, and so to me, uh, when we still see the, the issue that I feel like the community, because again, the community has some very set demands. And of course, this family has some own individual set demands that we are going to still see play out, uh, hopefully through the lawsuit that we know that the litigation has now been moved forward by uh, the best friend of Anthony, which is the Grayland, Grayland Strong family, uh, and as well as Anthony Thompson Jr.'s family. And so to me, my key thing that I, I'm getting frustrated with from Chief Thomas to now Paul Noel and Indy Cannon, Charmaine Allen, all the players that are involved in this as the elected and appointed. Again, these are the officials. You all are the government council here. Uh, and my frustration is just not seeing adult accountability about how poorly this was handled, how we, as all our parents ourselves, we don't want to ever have to live this type of trauma or this type of experience of horror where you're getting a call or a door knock telling you that your child has died in what should be one of the safest places of your kids' community. That's where they died at. And it's even worse to hear that the folks that you would doubt 911 in these situations is the one that's responsible for this. And so to me, that's where everybody continues to miss the mark. I am just still waiting for someone to say, this should have never happen because we are the trained paid professionals and therefore when we look at the rounds of how Eddie Thompson Jr. got killed as much as folks want to throw on the gun it is not the gun because again there's a protocol for when a person has a gun and how we're going to approach this and here's why I get really frustrated Brian because I know you can also recall this because I, like I said I like talking to people who are in tune to what the conversation is about if you recall, after Anthony Thompson Jr., we saw several incidents where KPD continue and Knox County Sheriff continue to encount, encounter gunmen that were armed and were able to bring in the, uh, uh, what was it, the uh, medita the uh, negotiating teams and yeah. those types of folks to walk these folks down. The one that sticks out to me the most is the guy that escaped from jail and then barricaded himself in somebody's house and had him at hostage. And he they walked him out without killing him. So I'm like, okay, now why was this application given to someone who is actually a convicted criminal? Because he was in jail that escaped from jail gets that kind of consideration for life but y'all cannot practice the same consideration for a 17 year old child in a high school bathroom this is where i get frustrated where i say no people know what they're doing people know what's going on and so this is why i said again paul noel's already showed that he is a problematic hire uh and he is really for me between india and him and such a poor job of her leadership are the motivation for me to really consider running for mayor of knoxville because i feel like we have to raise these issues so people can get wide as voters and really start to get serious about the changes we need to see because all of this starts at the end of the day at the ballot and that's what voters need to understand it is your job it is your fault and it is your responsibility we see these things happening we don't get the changes we need voters it is your fault because that's how we even got here because you put them here to do this poor leadership and these poor decisions in the first place well and, and that's uh that that's where i was going to go eventually uh and you just jumped right in there. So, I mean, I know you've got your you've got your statewide organization, your Tennessee for everyone, um, uh, for your governor's race, and and uh, barring any barring any unforeseen um, changes in twenty twenty six, you know, I think you've indicated that you plan to run for governor again. But uh, as as we uh, India can canon this past week, the week before uh, Thanksgiving twenty twenty two. Uh, had a, a big uh, kickoff for her um, 2023 campaign. Uh, a lot of a lot of um, money people, a lot of community people uh, were on the host list, uh, and she doesn't appear to have um, a serious opponent. I mean, uh, Larson J, county commissioner, uh, had toyed with the idea, um, and he's not going to do it. Uh, there's one name out there: former KPD officer Keith Lyon, <coughs> that. Um, that uh, has been going around some Republican clubs talking about it, but really and truthfully, um, there's not been a uh, there's not been a serious challenger uh, to uh, India Kincannon. So, have people been encouraging you? Are you thinking about it? And when you do officially announce, we announce it on the Brian Hornback Experience. <laughs> So, yes, yes, uh, you know, even some, uh, you know, yes, uh, one of the strategies behind this, uh, and, you know, Brian, you know, I'm transparent because, you know, I don't care about telling people what I'm going to do. Right. Because I'm going to do, I'm like Nike, I just do it. So, it don't right. matter if I tell you not, I'm going to do it regardless of <laughs> that. If you stop me, then good luck because I'm quite a freight train to deal with when you talk about trying to stop me. Uh, so, um, yeah, so 
the, the strategy around the statewide team is that, you know, the biggest issue was name recognition, obviously, with the race. Sure. Uh, we did catch win at that last minute on the tail end, uh, thanks to some of those uh, bigger uh, local but national uh, organizations like NABO. I cannot give them enough love. I think they really hit a trailblazer for us, giving us that last minute uh, welcome for our campaign. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, the, the concept was that, you know, we needed to find a way to keep my name prevalent. Uh, like I told my team, I'm not one of those candidates. I'm not going to run every single race. Uh, I was like, I only want to run races that one, I am, I believe there's a purpose or even a, a reason for me to run in the first place. Uh, and then two, uh, we need to run for positions that really had some type of, of, of authoritarianism to, to itself. Unfortunately, I hate to say it like that, but that's what we really need, uh, because we're trying to shift the power, uh, narrative and, and trying to change the, the way that our, our government is operating and so i was like yeah i'm not gonna just go for anything and so uh talking with the campaign statewide talking even with fellow candidates that i knew that was running like i have some friends that was running for congress uh, up there in the fifth district he's a veteran i can't think of his name right now i apologize for that but uh he had hit me up saying he was going to run for mayor in his area he's asked me about it he thought that with the governor race it was a really good opportunity to jump in with some of that recognition and ride away to push it to the governor race with it um and you know some of the data that we've been pulling in for the campaign uh we had gotten a few surveys from some folks in some of the counties where like you talked about earlier we had good numbers uh and when we had some of that information come back one of the things that some of the older voters uh more like the baby boomers so we're talking about our six-year-old up voters basically were saying to some of the folks who did some uh feedback for us was that basically uh they wanted to vote for me but their concern was that i was young and i had no experience uh and so a lot of uh, those folks had encouraged as something like get into a local race or, or get a local seat first uh, and run again for governor because maybe then that would build more confidence for that particular demographic. Uh, and so just taking the feedback even and, and hearing what people are saying that will give them more confidence for my next governor race to vote the next time around when I come back on the ticket. Uh, just taking all that information in. Uh, and like I said, yes, hearing that Indy Kincaid is not going to run for uh, have any real runners against her and I don't like uncontested racing. I think that's, that, that's just a glitch in itself in politics. And so, yes, I just feel like if no one's going to step up and challenge Indy other I don't have a problem with stepping up challenging India. I've, I've done it many times so for the mural, for Juneteenth, uh, like you said, for the protest, even just the protest, I've had to be the one of the lead voices to say, no, we're going to protest because it's our right and we're going to do this. Uh, and so uh, I feel like it'll be a good race. I think it'll definitely put India and the Democratic Party on their toes. Uh, I expect them to be dirty and foul. And then I may even ask the Republican Party if they're interested having a candidate. And if they think that I'm the candidate to run their ticket, I'm not even against running on the Republican ticket just because to give the hype of the party and the support of the party that I know it brings uh, for the mayor race. For the governor race, though, I will be maintaining the independent ticket. Uh, I just think it's critical for that type of race and what that race means to me to stay independent for that. But for this local stuff, I don't mind running on the Republican ticket, uh, especially, like I said, against Indy Kincannon for the mayor seat. Right. Well, and, and you bring up a, you bring up an interesting point. You know, we got three branches of government. We got the judiciary, which you and I aren't lawyers, so we can't we can't run for the judiciary. So that leaves the legislative or the executive. And, you know, if you, if you want to be one of nine on a city council, that's all well and fine. If you want to be one of 11 on a county commission, that's all in well, well and fine. But if you really want to make um, the if you really want to make real change, uh, the real change at the executive level. So, you know, uh, for whatever uh, your distract dis, distractors will say, uh, I think I think uh, you, you've obviously approached it from a very. A very solid uh, standpoint. So, uh, where can uh, so is blackcoffeejustice.com Is it still up? Is Tennessee T N the number four every E V E R Y the number one dot com? Is it still up? Where's Where's the best place that people can find you um, out there in the interweb? Yeah, yeah. Tennessee for everyone is still up and running. It's going to stay up and running. We have no intentions of shutting it down just for this reason. So folks know where to find us. Uh, so that's definitely a still live, active everything. So yes, people are more than welcome to get the website up. And yes, of course, our our, our social justice organization, Black Coffee Justice, uh, you can definitely still find us there. There's some exciting news, an update for Black Coffee Justice real quick for the show. Uh, Black Coffee Justice just raised itself as a lobbyist organization. Uh, and we have some registered lobbyists under the Black Coffee Justice organization. Uh, 
situation. So we'll be on the Hill still representing uh, and, and still, you know, getting into the policy of what we're doing on the state level and keeping an eye on the works of what's happening on our statewide and how it's impacting folks around the around our state uh, to keep them informed. Uh, and so, yeah, so we're still doing things. So, yeah, I'll be running for mayor and uh, probably be doing some lobbyist work as well this year, uh, coming 23 year, because, uh, you know, like I said, uh, I'm very serious about changes. Uh, and as you mentioned, Brian, I've been on the outside for a while, and I realized that the way we're going to make real changes, yes, we have to get aside, and we have to pursue these seats in the judicial, the legislative, and the executive branches uh, to bring the real changes that we're trying to create as the people who really want to see the government that works for everyone. Well, and, and before we before we end this episode 114 with Constance Avery, I do want to remind folks that we're actually recording this and, and doing this uh, the day before uh, Thanksgiving. So, you know, Constance and I, you know, while, while sometimes we get in the, in the media and we talk a lot and we advocate a lot, uh, I do want to let people know that Constance has been out in the community today making sure that families have Thanksgiving meals tomorrow. So, again, Constance, everything that you've done, uh, you know, you and I can disagree on issues from time to time, and, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, uh, the bottom line is that, uh, you know, I, I know you, you've gone out and you, you've provided food to people when they're hungry, you've provided clothing, you've provided, uh, school supplies. Uh, so you, you are making an impact in so many different ways. And, um, and ultimately that's, that's, I mean, that's what it's about. And, uh, you, you should be commended too. I know you spent what, 15 years in the army. Um, yeah. and so, you know, people, you know, people can say, well, she looks young. Well, yeah, she looks young because um, cause she looks young. But the fact is you have the experience and, and you have the dedication. Uh, and again, we can disagree on issues. Uh, on situations like Anthony Thompson Jr., um, you know, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's it's unconscionable that it happened. And uh, I, 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 along with you, believe that that the people that need to make it right, need to make it right. Right, right. Um, And that's because Brian Hornback is a father. And you're speaking from mm -hmm. a father, not from Brian Brian Hornback, the show. Uh, And yet, like I said, I agree. The callousness of of our leadership is very disturbing to me. I I really want them to look at this from the parental perspective. Right. Well, Constance, thanks for being on episode 114. Uh, Keep in touch. We'll look forward to to seeing what happens in 2023 and then in 2026. And, uh, Anytime that you need uh, to be on the Brian Hornback experience, all you got to do is give me a call. I sure will. I owe you an announcement. I got right. you. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Constance. Have a happy Thanksgiving. No Thank, Thank you. Happy holidays, too. Right, bye.